Welcome to Vlog Thursday. Now that the number is correct, depending on which number you see, because I did update it, 307. I actually got it right in the, um, what you call it. I got it right in one part of it, and I got to mute my phone. There's a lot of people that message me. All right. They will get message back after the vlog. <laughs> There's too many messages. That happens sometimes. Such as life. Such as life. Um, but first things first, why am I doing it early? Um, same reason I do it late. There's, there's like scheduling conflicts and I mean, maybe I could do it while I was driving. That seems unwise. Cause I would like to answer questions, but I do have a semi self-driving car. So, you know, I probably could do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm away today to the Ohio Linux Fest. So I thought I'd bring that up first and, uh, you know, that's going to be fun, a fun event. I imagine. Uh, some of you will be there. Just you sure. Ever, hey, for those of you who watch my studio tour, you may know there's a space heater really close to me. It was a little bit too close when I faced this particular camera. So I just moved it over. If you wonder where that nose are. So we got things to do today. Yes, we do. Um, many, many things to do. But first things first, uh, though, is just me mentioning that I'll be the next couple of days at Ohio Linux Fest. As I said, that's why it's in the title. I, I realized I did this kind of backwards. If I should put like, you know, where Tom's going to be first and then 45 drives or XCPNG. But I think we're going to talk about XCPNG updates. Um, I am in I have a finite amount of time uh, today because I actually am trying to accomplish all the things. So I'm going to have to wrap this up here at 11 because I already scheduled another appointment. And uh, so it's not like my usual where I can just babble on, uh, but I don't want to bump the appointments around. So. Hey, thanks for mentioning Ohio, Lin Ohio Linux Fest earlier this week. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but can only attend Saturday. Well, I'll be there uh, today. There's something going on. I don't know much about what's going on, but I seen there's a thing, uh, mm -hmm. some gathering of people. Um, but whatever, I like getting, I'm, I am getting in on Thursday, so I, I'm just coming a little bit earlier. It's not that far of a drive. I think it's two and a half hours or three hours or something like that. Uh, but I'll be there Saturday and I'm leaving on Sunday morning. So uh, good morning. Question, do you surveillance camera system? Yes, we surveillance camera system. Uh, I actually have, I've thought about doing a follow-up video on this because now that they've been here like a year and I've done a several videos in general about my surveillance station, we definitely sell a lot of these as a solution. Um, but yeah, I have this one at my house. Uh, the nice thing about having one at my house is I can share this because I give myself permission to share, um, all the leaves that have blown into my garage and then you can uh, see my barn or see my backyard. <laughs> this one, this one camera does this sometimes. It kind of just pauses. It's my front porch. It doesn't do it all the time. Uh, it just pauses sometimes. Now it's always recording. There's no delay in the recording, but uh, yes, we do uh, Synology surveillance stations. Yes, we really like the Synology surveillance systems. Um, and it's just a, uh, it's just a great system overall. It, we're really, uh, we definitely uh, are happy with it as a product that scales well. And I might do a follow-up video on all the cameras I use to say, hey, how do they hold up after a year? Which, by the way, these are some of the same cameras we've installed for customers. So I think I have a couple that might have failed. And I'm trying to compile that list because sometimes things happen. Um so I'll mm -hmm. talk about which ones work, which ones didn't. But for the most part, the Amcrest that we've been going with work really, really well. So... That's been good. Stream is good in the Midwest. Someone said stream is not good in Toronto. I already have an idea why that camera does that. Oh, good. Me and Travis, uh, we'll have to chat about that later. So <laughs> uh, let's see. Hi from San Francisco. And my stream is good all the way in Europe. So the, the next thing, though, that I actually wanted to talk about, and it's going to be... Uh, Oops, that's not. I should. Have, I should have had the links ready, right? Um, there we go. <clears throat> but this has been. Oh, and oh, by the way, Streamyard. Thank you. Streamyard is a tool I use for this, um, and they've made it easier for me to switch tabs. This was a feature they had, and I don't know why it went away. I don't know if it's a problem with Chrome um, or whatnot, but I couldn't just uh, choose a different tab. So there's actually a button that says share this tab. 
or share this tab. And I can just quickly now jump between all the tabs I have open instead of actually having to uh, go through like several menus to do it. It's the little things that make me happy. This like that feature, that feature really is one of them. But XO, there's been some more changes on this. And I thought, you know, I, I don't know if I should do dedicated videos to it. They have dedicated videos, but, you know, I like raising some awareness and testing it. But the thing I'm playing with now, or I should say can play with now is warm migration. I just think this is a really neat feature uh, that they're integrating. So it's the ability to uh, get two separate servers synchronized in terms of all the data, the VDIs and everything like that, and then finalize that synchronization and minimize downtime when you have to do a migration to a server that you can't just live migrate to. So it, ideally you want a hot migration. Let's just go ahead and synchronize it between this new server, which is also uh, one of my favorite magical things about virtualization. You come in, you drop a new server in, you configure it, you tie it to the existing pool, and then without any downtime, I migrate the existing servers over to the new servers and the client doesn't experience downtime and the servers are all still up and running. Magic. Well, that magic breaks with things like changing processor design. So if you go from an Intel to an AMD based system, you have to restart that server. Now, restarting, it's not a big deal, but shutting it down, migrating it, then restarting it, that might be a little bigger deal. So that's where this warm migration system comes up. And it's just slick. It's just a it's a way to uh, take things. Let me find if I have some something I can. I, you know, I don't even know if I can really warm migrate it. So I can't, I don't know if I'll be able to do this demo live, but I can show you where the button is and uh, goof around with it. Also, I'm going to do the over-provisioning of CPUs that's something that people have questions about as well. Um, what happens when you over provision, which is really nothing. So if we go, it's like VM one and then we'll go to VM two here. Actually, well, this is what servers are they on now? So both of these have 24 cores assigned to them which is only 24 cores available on the host. By the way, there's plenty of other VMs running on the host, but yes, you can over-provision them. Uh, but I, I'm going to run some Pharonix benchmarks to get that going. But the th reason I did this was we can talk about the warm migration option. So you can say, hey, where do you want to send this? And let's, you know, we could send this over to our lab. And then warm migration is a process. And get that bigger warm migration. We'll first create a copy of the VM on the destination while the source VM is running, then shut down the source VM and send the changes that are happening during the migration destination and minimize downtime. So it's kind of just an automated way to do this. I mean, you can do this manually, um, keep it synchronized and then finally do a shutdown migration, but being able to just click a button and automate this, oh, I didn't switch tabs. So we'll share this tab. There we go. Yeah, change tabs, please. Thank you. I should pay attention to what I'm doing. Uh, but yeah, this is the warm migration option. So back to the CPU over provision though, just so go backwards in time to talk about what I was doing. Here are two machines, both running with 24 CPUs allocated and they're running on a host with only with 24 CPUs along with lots of VMs. Uh, I just got to set up a demo where I'm using Pharonix and showing you what happens when you take 12 and 12 because it's 24 CPU. So we take two VMs, 12 and 12, we run them, we get a benchmark. What happens when we run that same benchmark that is CPU intensive where we have 24 and 24? How does it split? Do we get the same results? Too long, didn't watch. The results are very, very similar. They're very close. They're not substantially different. And that's kind of the point. The hypervisor does a great job of handling the CPUs and figuring out how to balance all of that together. So uh, definitely pretty neat. <clears throat> it's definitely uh, uh, it just the magic of virtualization, you know, it just makes me happy. But back to the warm migration. Yeah, I'll play with that later uh, in a separate video because I think it's just, I, I actually just need to do an entire long in-depth getting started with Zen and all the features of Zen uh, server combined with XCPNG because it's just impressive everything that you can do with it. And every time I check, there's always some new feature that gets added, you know, like, hey, warm migration. Who knew we needed this? Let's just migrate that to our lab and we'll do a warm migration and get it. You know, I could probably, we're doing it live, right? Um, 
lab pool. Sure. I don't know how this task works. Let's see what happens. Oh, look what importing contents, five minutes. All right. So that's how it works. Now we know. Uh, we'll go back over here to YouTube projects. Oh, and there's our warm migration. So it tells me that it's doing it. Neat. All right. So now I know how it works. <laughs> We're all learning. I just updated this this morning because it just came out uh, yesterday. This this blog post was uh, yesterday uh, for 577. So war migration. Uh, this is neat, too, for people that are trying to get clever with things. Uh, you can do. I, I think this is really neat. A REST API now has two endpoint requests, VM snapshot and BDI snapshots. You can fetch any info related to your snapshots, VM or disk. Uh, this was just a neat way to be able to use APIs to call things in there to build automation around it. Uh, that's really cool. And I will be testing this uh, soon, the new XO Lite. Um, this is the request that a lot of people have is that it natively has some type of UI without having to load the full Zen Orchestra VM. And that's something they're working on it. I don't use Nagios, but they... Uh, Apparently, they improved the Nagios reports. You know, I never tried removing TOTP for a user. Um, I thought it was, you know, interesting that I guess remove TOTP. I guess once you add it, you can't. I never tried to remove it, so I didn't know that was uh, um, a problem. But it turns out you couldn't remove it. So now you can hit remove on TOTP to uh, unlock someone if need be. So, oh, uh, in our honor up. In our interoperability quest, we've always allowed people to uh, try our platform. So the uh, try our platform, get decent standard support from VM formats. So you can now export SCG, VMware, KVM, or anything supporting OVA format. I This is just great. They took the time, which very few companies do. They usually do not want to ever build a feature like this because they're like, no, 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 no. Once you come into our ecosystem, we would never want you to leave our ecosystem. So uh, I think that's kind of neat that they uh, have been working on that. Uh, backup resiliency, merge process refactoring, made easier test to maintain, fix edge cases. Uh, yeah, I posted about edge cases. Their forums are a great place on that. And they're also on Mastodon. So that's the whole change log for Zen Orchestra. I figured I'll bring it up here. Curious how fast migration is going. Anecdotal experience is that disk transfers are fairly slow. Don't use nearly entire network bandwidth available. Yes, the TAP disk currently, uh, V1 API is, um, not it's they, there's a whole write-up i did recently if you watch my video i explain it better in how zen handles storage there's a problem basically as and I, i'll use their own words spaghetti code uh the spaghetti code that is the current version of the way they handle disk is old and was written a long time ago now it's safe it's secure and security in zen is really high but that also brings forth challenges of making it fast because by creating all these isolated processes um you end up with a really secure environment, but a harder to work with environment. So the individual disk processes have a lot of dependencies built on um, that security model, which make it slow. But the new version, still maintaining security that they're working on, will be out probably sometime next year, I think, um, is going to be substantially faster. So their new implementation, and watch, I, I link to all the, there's a series of blog posts that they have on the topic. So if you have a slower processor, uh, you will have slower transfers uh, when it comes to moving it, and you won't hit your bandwidth limits of your interconnect. Um, that's definitely true. It seems to have had an error. I think I seen an error. Oh, it didn't start. No host available because there's too many. Now, I already know why it failed. Not because of a problem. This. The lab pool um, only has 12 cores. So I that's why it failed. So that's kind of fun. Let's do let's destroy this VM because it's not important to me at all. Let's remove it. And let's play that game again. So uh, remove because we don't need it. Uh, we'll go to YouTube. Stop this one. Let's rename it. So this is going to be actually 
where does it go? Is there a better icon? Was there a file? There we go. Here we can I I've not tried this. Let's see if this breaks something. <laughs> there we go. Why not? I think this should be capitalized. It'll bother me. Here's our warm migration test. First, let's reduce it to four cores. Let's reduce it to, uh, to I don't want to overload our lab server, which is not, not that fast. Um, of note, CPU limits, four. All right, cool. If you don't do this, uh, you're trying to move it to something that may not have the same CPU limits for scalability, so you may run into other problems. But nonetheless, here's our... Uh, warm migration test that we're going to do again. And now that we have less cores assigned to it, it should actually work. That's my theory. So make sure it boots up. Actually, let's go to YouTube. Um, yeah, good news is because it didn't start on the other one, um, it didn't move it. But I I also told it not to delete. That's an option. Um and let's actually do that too. So I don't really need these. So let's go ahead and remove them. Wait, two VMs. All right. This is started. Advanced. Warm migration. Move it over to the lab. Um, start the migrated VM. That's one of our things we want to do. So... We're going to delete the source VM. We're going to do that. We're, we're doing it live because, well, if it breaks, I'm not too worried about it. Hit OK. All right. Let the process begin, and it'll now do that transfer over there. All right. <laughs> uh, is that water bottle rum or Coke? Well, I don't like rum and Coke. I don't like sweet drinks. I like whiskey. Um, but all day, I drink water. Uh, I drink coffee in the morning, sometimes some tea later, but mostly water because I'm boring like that. Um, then whiskey, whiskey is my nighttime drink. So that's, that's my, uh, drink for the year. Is there a good online kicker for determining approximate rewrite differences of various flavors of ZFS disc combinations? Uh, yes. Um, there's this place called... So if we look for it, here we go. Let me throw a link to this. Uh, this is a link to um, my write-up that contains links to Everything you wanted to know about ZFS, lots of choosing layouts from Clara Systems, who does amazing jobs, uh, Clara Inc. Um, but there's also benchmarks in here, uh, ZFS, performance, integrity. There's so many things I put together in here. So lots and lots of reading, uh, including even a whole thing from IAC Systems on this too. So the answer is, it's complicated. So there's not an easy answer for it, but I do break it down and explain it um, in this entire link. And I actually, I keep this maintained. I've actually updated this link several times to talk about, you know, six metrics measuring performance. If you look, there's a lot of edits where I've added more things to this. It's kind of a cumulative knowledge on there. How big is that VM in terms of disk space? Good question. Let's go ahead and share this tab instead. Now, I could show you how much is assigned to it, but that's actually not going to give you the answer you're looking for. So 60 gigs is assigned, but I already know it's not 60 gigs. Uh, I don't think this is installed, actually. But why not teach people something fun? Anyone use Duff, D-U-F? 
I can use DF. That's obviously going to give you the answer, but Duff, Duff is prettier. There you go. Oh, Duff isn't color coded here. I don't know why. Anyways, um, used is eight gigs. So this is a eight gig VM. Eight plus the 250 for boot. So that should help answer that. Oh, hey, look, it's it's gone. <laughs> it's it's finding a new home. So here's its new home. More migration test. And do we delete? Is it going to delete the old one? Does it wait till it boots? I don't know. Let's find out. We have two of them now. Oh, cool. It's it started. It's got the same IP address. Now we get to watch the last process of uh, purging the old VM. I'm, I'm assuming it'll do that automatically. So let's see how that works. Hmm? Still no deletion. Huh. It started. It just isn't. Well, I guess we just got to wait for it to delete. FreeBSD ping CVE announced today. Neat. Let's look that up real quick, because why not? That sounds interesting. Um, there we go. Vuln DB has it. Type BSD was an announced. Let's see. Vulnerability free BSD operating systems and rated criticals affects issue per pack being the manipulation with an unknown input leads to stack based overflow. So we have a CVE reserved for it, but not a lot of inf not a ton of info here on it. Ping utility invoked with IPv4. Let's see here. Make sure it's readable for everyone. Uh, I said I'm going to read Graham requests have IP followed by struct time removal. I'm sure more pad bytes to use remake. Which is buffer overflow affecting PR pack function can be leveraged, cause stack overflow could lead to a crash or remote code execution in ping. Oh. So you have to ping from BSD to make that happen, if I'm reading this correctly. Copies received, IP and IC header stack buffers. So if you're pinging from FreeBSD and someone replies with the exploit, it can overflow the destination by up to 40 bytes. Okay. Bad. Hopefully, uh, well, I'm sure there's a fix. Here's their security advisory. Let's pull that up, which is pulling up really slow. <laughs> but yeah, I'll dig into this. That's interesting. Uh, yep. No workaround is available. Upgrade your formal system to a supported FreeBSD stable release branch. So, yep. Update if you have that issue. So interesting. Um, back over to share this tab. So the the test worked. I just didn't. It just didn't delete the VM. I don't know why. But here we are running with the VM at the new location with the same IP address. So um, we'll go with it worked. Yeah, other than other than the deletion part, more migration for the the first iteration of it here uh, seems to have worked. Same IP address, same everything. New VM running, old VM off on pool of Zen. New VM running on lab server. So cool, that part worked. 
Uh, last thing I was going to talk about, we got a few more minutes. We can goof off and add, I'll answer questions if people throw them at me, by the way. But let me find the link to the other thing I'm working on. Where did it go? Or maybe I don't know. Oh, it's not on. Um, I'll just pull photos up of it. <laughs> but we are uh, working on some new stuff that we'll be sharing with um, the 45 Drive servers. I, I have been doing some more testing with their Houston OS, so I'll be doing some new videos on that uh, coming soon. That was all I was going to talk about for 45 Drives. I didn't, didn't have a whole lot to say about it. But uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's an, I like their platform. The ZFS manager is pretty cool. Um, I moved the server into the other area and I don't think I plugged the right network cable into it. So, uh, cause it's not, I can't get to the IP address on it. So I'll have to sort that out um, after my live stream. But nonetheless, I, I have some upcoming videos on 45 drives with Houston. Uh, those would be some things I'm talking about. So hopefully that's exciting to someone. I think I think people are interested in seeing it. You know, I do plenty of TrueNAS videos when I do a few 45 drives videos. Uh, next cloud installed on TrueNAS Quorum was able to pass external data set through that. However, external data set shows as a subfolder. Well, then you passed it through in the wrong spot. You have to pass it through so it's not a subfolder. You have to change the root of it. Um, what else we got in here? Just lots of hellos from all over the place because I don't have, I did not come prepared with a lot of things to talk about today, mostly just playing with things here. Actually, um, uh, let me move that out of the way because I want to change something. Hmm. Yep, that's what I thought. I just realized that when you have the um, OTP authentication, it always, it always shows it. Once you're logged in, you can see it again. So you can uh, see the keys. So I want, that's why I thought I was hiding that. Uh, you know, this is a feature not everyone knows. Let me scroll down so it hides my OTP key or, or QR code. But when you're doing uh, this, you can change your default filters for things like production VMs. I can change it to like Tom's projects. And once you do that, if it, it changed the default for this. Uh, so I have like these right here. There's a lot of little things like I, I thought about doing like a UI tips video uh, on some of the little things you can do in here that are just really good practice or not practices as much, but you know, like life help, uh, life hacks, like, Hey, use this right here. These tips and tricks will save you time type thing. Um, there's a lot of that in here when you have all these different VMs and you want to start tagging them differently, whether it's lab or Tom's projects that Tom's working on like Portainer. Yes. I'm going to work on a video for Portainer, but I forgot to turn it on. So I guess I should boot it up. Uh, but I'll be talking about some of those things soon. We need more likes. I'll go with that. Definitely need more likes. More likes are good. What's a good uh, way to find quality engineers from MSC? We're offering way above the salary in your area, in our area. Uh, it's not to find qualified engineers uh, that know what they're doing. Good question. Um, finding people, I mean, it's not easy. And it's partly a fault of the industry because... The industry is not matured enough to have a concise way to determine, um, you know, what is or is not a good technician. I mean, we have some certifications. It's getting better. It's substantially better than it was 25 years ago. Uh, but yeah, it's it, it's a challenge because you kind of have to look at candidates. And this was a LinkedIn post the other day. And let me see if I can find the post. because I thought this was a good way that Huntress looks at. It's, it's one of the things I really look at too. I thought this was just insightful from uh, this write-up. And I'm going to find it so I can share it here. So posts. 
Where did that go? Sometimes I post too much. There we go. Share this tab instead. So here's a good article that I will throw a link in here for. Um, but let's just jump to the too long didn't read portion. And this is, you know, how they hire. Hunters has hired a really top team of individuals. And these are the top three things that they're looking for. And please note that number one, is community involvement. Now, granted, we're talking about uh, people who are uh, in the cybersecurity space and threat hunting space, but the reality is um, the community involvement you have will drive a lot of your job offers. I know from working in the open source community, that's how a lot of people, a lot of my friends, uh, not just security friends, but other developers, by working on public projects and open source, that has led them to uh, really, really good job offers at places. Matter of fact, people seek them out. So they don't put job postings. They go around seeking them out because they're aware that they worked on a lot of public facing projects. You go to the events, um, you know, where you may find network engineers and things like that, you're more likely to find the candidate you're looking for rather than trying to get them to come to you. And the other challenge right now is if you're good, you're in demand and you're not usually looking for jobs. You almost have, I don't say have to, um, but it's almost uh, why it's probably why a lot of people go trying to poach those people. You know, for example, Facebook uh, just laid off Meta, whatever you want to call them, laid off 11,000 people. And I'm like, you know how hard it is to get a job at Meta? Those 11,000 people, people are, were already calling them before their layoff. Like their the, the time from layoff to job has everything to do with their choice, not whether or not they can find a job. Um, it's qualified people are hard and it's actually, I think it's a good thing that some of these large companies might be letting some of them go to give smaller companies an opportunity to hire them. But yeah, that definitely, um, it's just one of those things you really got to think about is like, maybe you have to seek some of them out, uh, just throwing it out there. The most qualified candidates are always employed. Um, and they just kind of make the decision. I've never, uh, even when I was, you know, people always offered me jobs. I never, I haven't looked for a job since I was 16 and I got an attack at like 18. And once I got an attack, um, I got job offers. I haven't filled out a resume since I was 16. And I, I did job hop a little bit, just offers I got, but people knew me, people knew I was capable of doing things. I always had a long, you know, a lot of people I interacted with and that sometimes led to them calling me for other jobs. So Uh, one of the best experience, what is the best way to get experience in your resume? What are, and what you're interested in, uh, or what your boss wants to do? I don't, I don't know. I just always ran out and did things and started working on them a lot. Um, so I don't, I don't have an easy answer for that one. Like I always knew what I wanted to do. So I wonder if they have headhunting firms for it, like they do for executive talent. Oh, they more than have headhunting teams. They'll drive you bananas. Go, go. Uh, I don't know how bad it is on LinkedIn anymore, um, but I know for a while, a few of my friends, um, one of them, he developed some of the training for Cisco. And it was wild just how many job offers he got constantly. Uh, he got a recruiter once. He had this, he's kind of obnoxious occasionally, but he really got sick of the recruiter. So he would have them do things. Um, uh, like one time he got them to have a, uh, lawn service come and mow his lawn. He said after they did that, then they would, uh, he would consider, <laughs> uh, one of their job offers and things like that. <laughs> it was kind of funny sometimes, but he was just getting so, uh, many job offers. He was just like, I don't know. I'll make them compete with each other. I don't know. Do something with them. Thoughts on land sweeper and PRTG. I don't use either of them, so I have no thoughts on them. The other problem too, the uh, want a new job, want a new job thing. There's a, a lot of terrible offers that are misaligned. Jay told me a great story though of uh, someone calling him, making him a job offer, a headhunter. Um, and it turns out that the place that wanted to hire him 
they wanted to hire him for the place he worked to replace him. But the recruiter was disconnected from who he was replacing. So it was kind of a fun story. <laughs> Home lab is good stuff to put on a resume. Um, yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, home lab, or I've met people who worked on large open source projects and things like that too. So, I'm a few minutes in, but you didn't select to delete of him. Oh, I didn't select it. Okay, I thought I did. So that explains. Um, So that probably explains the old VM existing. So let's do this. So let's let's delete it and remove. Thank you, people who noticed the details Tom doesn't know. Uh, go back to YouTube. Let's rename this. So it has a nice clean name. All right. We'll take this tag off of it. It's currently in the lab pool. We want to do a uh, warm migration. Back over to here. Delete source. Start the VM. So if this works, we've now checked both. Delete the source for virtual machine and start the VM once it's migrated. So hit OK. So let this run in the background while I babble about things for five more minutes. Uh, are there any cases for which you would hire an IT contractor rather than DIY? I don't understand the question. IT contractor or do it yourself? I mean, we use contractors, so I guess I that's why I don't understand the question. Um, as needed, we use contractors and work in collaboration with other IT companies or IT contractors. So uh, I don't understand the DIY. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess you mean do it internally. Um, I would read it as that. But yeah, well, if I'm going to answer a really obvious question here, is this my problem? Should I delete media and go straight to root? If you're seeing a nested destination because you mounted it at the wrong spot, then the answer to that is yes. So uh, probably if you want it not to have a nested destination, point the root at wherever you did the mount point at. Do you think Hyper-V core is overlooked? I think Hyper-V, uh, here, call me out on this. Um, I predict Microsoft in five years drops Hyper-V uh, as a supported product. I think it's um, hot garbage is my personal opinion of it. Uh, I would not run a Microsoft hypervisor. I don't. I, I don't trust Microsoft. They can't even get patching right. Microsoft is a fickle company. They decide where they can make money, and then they put effort there. When they don't want to make money, they'll still keep selling the product. Uh, but if they think the writing's on the wall, i.e. exchange, they go, you know, we're just going to keep selling the product, but we're going to give you the most worst support ever because what are you going to do? Use something else like our hosted uh, thing. So, yeah. I, I wouldn't surprise if Microsoft gets bored with it because they haven't really built a big monetization model around it. They want you to use their cloud. So I wouldn't build anything future facing out on Hyper-V. But uh, you do you. Um, and I'm not right about everything. I, I'm not going to claim I'm right about everything. Uh, I think I'm right about this. That's why I'm saying it. But I can. you can feel free in five years from now. Hey, Tom, remember in vlog 307 when you said Hyper-V and now everyone's using Hyper-V? I'd be utterly shocked. But uh, yeah. So nonetheless, um, yeah, Microsoft just wants stuff to the cloud. XCPNG is getting bigger on things uh, for good reasons. Hey, I'll end this blog at the same time that this finishes. So when this is finished, the blog's over. So you have three minutes remaining while it does the migration. Do, do, moving it from here to there. Look at that go. But yeah. Skip 45 drive went the dish shelf route. NetApp disk array works amazing. Yeah, use whatever works. I like the I like the 45 drive ones. They there's a reason there's a few more of them at my office that we're doing videos on. <laughs> 
I'm too early. Can't watch because of a meeting. Yeah, I'll be driving later. So. Hey, look. It's starting. Now, I did make sure I checked the delete button. Let's see if it actually deletes. That's what we're that's what we're waiting on right now. I bet it deletes one that detects the tools running because that's how it's going to know that it started and worked. So it's probably waiting for the tools to run. You'll know when they run because an IP address will pop up here. Um, that's when it, you know it's communicating properly. So. Uh, by the way, this is their first iteration of it. So. XCPNG is great. I, doc I, I wish your documentation was good as Microsoft. Well, I'm not going to say that Microsoft has great documentation. And I am among the people contributing to the documentation. Like I make a lot of things talking about XCPNG. So I selected delete last time. You don't think it's working expected. Okay. I think you might be correct. I thought I did last time. Someone says I didn't, but that's fine. Um, I think the very first time I did not do it. So there, there is some truth to it. Um, but nonetheless, here we are. It, But I don't really, I don't think in production, I would ever click the delete button. I would rather do it exactly as it did it, move it over, get it started. Um, and that's it. Like, hey, cool. It's over here now. Um, I don't need it over here now. So let's go ahead and remove it. Because it's over here now. Also, now that I know I can use these icons in here, guess guess what Tom's going to do? I'm going to see what breaks if I put icons everywhere in here. I don't think it matters, but I'm wondering what happens if you name all of these. Now, the VMs are actually all done by these uh, UUIDs right here. That's how they're managed in the back end. But we have these user-friendly names up here. And if I put icons and things, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> I think that's just novel. Well, anyways, I got to go. I got to go do the next thing. Uh, let's see. Are you better off installing uh, package jails instead of using a TrueNAS core thoughts? Uh, I don't use jails in TrueNAS core, so I don't. I mean, I kind of do, but not much. Uh, I prefer to install NextCloud as its own thing usually, but do you do you. Uh, have you ever used WatchCard? I used them. I hated them. I can't understand why people like the product. I found it not intuitive and nothing impressed me about it, but some people really like it. So if you like it, I, I don't think they've had too many uh, security issues. Uh, did you cover anchors uh, cameras security fasco yet? Uh, I recommend Synology for surveillance station. So um, I didn't look at anchor uh, security cameras. Wait 10 days, then delete production. Yeah, pretty much. How is the compatibility with XCPNG problems like uh, with providers like OVH? Well, I don't use OVH or Henser, so I don't know. And what Travis said, we like Synology surveillance stations, and a couple of us use UNOFI Protect. Yeah, I like it better as a Linux VM, but... You know, that's my, I don't really use NextCloud though. Uh, I, we don't use it in production at all. I play with it. I, it's not a production thing for me. So I'm not a NextCloud expert. Uh, we have zero customers using it and I have zero customers that I will be pushing to NextCloud. Uh, I, I don't think anyone, the cost savings you get by not paying Microsoft is cool for home users. The cost savings for business is not always as much because the, the maintaining can be harder uh, or more expensive. I don't know. Uh, have you used sound? I've tested it. Uh, it works, but I don't use it. My, I think I have one client using it. Uh, I may talk a little bit more about it because they've got some cool things they do for synchronization. Um, we've, we've got a couple of clients, I think using it right now. Um, they're using the drive that the sync locations are using it. So we're not specifically using drive, but I think it's, um, you know, a, a function of drive to do the synchronization. I'd have to look at it. You know, I should have came out and addressed this. Maybe I'll do a video on it. Last pass hacked is not really news. It's just a disclosure. Um, I don't know. Everyone seems to get excited about it. There's no meat 
there, it's like, of course, there's going to be a security incident. They're big. And saying that this couldn't happen to insert name of smaller company, it may have, and they don't know. There's one option. It also may be that if I'm going to, if I'm a threat actor, where do I put my effort? Do I put my effort in the company with the biggest jackpot or the small company with a hundred users just so I can own those users and say, look, they can't say that this product didn't get hacked. You have to think about it from that perspective. The problem is it's a double-edged sword of doing disclosure of you can lose trust in your product because so many companies don't always disclose things very well. And until we understand what was hacked, it's not news. We know that there's an investigation. Great. We know that they have a zero trust architecture model like all the other companies. Awesome. So those at least are some mitigations that should prevent it from being a bigger disaster. I would like to see the debrief. Mandiant uh, has been engaged with this particular last pass event. Mandiant does great jobs on write-ups. Awesome. Here we are. That's it. I'm, that's enough information for me for now because anything else is just a lot of speculative news and a bunch of news companies trying to be first with the article that has no more information than I just told you. Uh, go read the last last blog. There's just not much not much to read in there yet and because they don't know either. They said there's an incident. Uh, well, they may know some more internally, but they're not ready to release the details. So they're just following up going, hey, something happened. There was a thing going on and we hired the smart people to go look at the thing more news later not now so you know we'll see what outcomes of it if it turns out that they're actually inept well that's interesting uh and we can talk about that oh yeah they made some poor choices as a company but don't shame the victim because reality is someone a threat actor broke in their door if someone kicks down my door and you say tom why didn't you use a better door? Why didn't you put a bank vault on the front of your house? I mean, at what point do you uh, think about what's reasonable? And obviously, if you're last pass, hopefully you do have a pretty solid door. But you kind of think about that. It's uh, There's this weird uh, amount of victim blaming when reality is the threat actors are the real problems here. I don't know how to stop them. Uh, and obviously, that's a whole different topic. But you got to really think about things in a very objective way because just subjectively saying, well, oh, yeah, of course, LastPass got hacked doesn't really help move the security bar forward or think objectively about what's actually going on or provide any real intelligence. By the way, I don't like LastPass for other reasons. <laughs> so <laughs> security things aside, I'm a bit warden user. Um, but, you know, I just always like to throw out there, think very objectively about things uh, as opposed to just getting excited about the news. So. Build a safe room. There we go. Just get rid of the door. There we go. Doors aren't secure. Exactly. All right. I'm out of here. Have fun, everyone. Uh, and then for those of you that are joining me in Ohio Linux Fest, I'll see you in the next couple of days. Later.